Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll take a look at the new Spirit of the Sandbagger Monument in Fargo. But first, joining me now is our guest, and it's Fargo State Legislator, Ruth Buffalo. Uh, Representative Buffalo, thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, Madza um, Gidads, thank you, and the Hidadza language. Yes, well, great. As we get started, we always ask, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, well, it's protocol and, and to hold myself accountable in learning our Hidadza language. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce myself in the Hidadza language. Please. Nakbaga o Madashi Mia Adesh heads Ma Sagids Madzagidads Nakbaga o. So I said, um, hello good people. Um, I am I said my name, my uh, Hidadza name is is Woman Appears. Um, it was a name transfer handed on to me um, is my late grandmother Ruth's Hidadza name, Woman Appears. And so I'm honored to be here and I also said it's a good day. It so. is a good day. <laughs> yeah. And again, thanks so much. How has your adjustment been and change uh, becoming a state legislator? Uh, how's it gone for you and uh, can you talk about some of the issues that are key to you? Sure, yeah, it's been um, an interesting adjustment. Um, it's amazing to the um, degree of, I think many people um, across the state, even country, will refer to me as a congresswoman. And so it tells me there's a lot of educating that we need to do in terms of state government and what exactly we do at the state government. Uh, we're often referred to as citizen legislators. Um, it's, it's considered part-time. We meet every other year, and we are one of five states, I believe, that meet every other year, and one of four states where our House state reps are four-year terms. Um, so I've been doing a lot of educating, but it's nothing new to me um, as a former um, coach, wellness program director and educator um, by default as a Native American in our country I feel like we, we're constantly educating and filling in the gaps of of our nation's history so I joke and say by default Native Americans tend to be educators <laughs> um, so yeah I, I am adjusting well and learning so much still but also still have a passion to want to share as much information as I can to our citizens so they can be more well informed of these processes and participate in these processes. Mm -hmm. Well, today, Representative uh, Buffalo, we, we want to talk about this issue, uh, or a lot about issues rather, but, but we want to talk about Columbus Day. Uh, recently, uh, Columbus Day uh, has, has gone by and, and now called in most uh, states Indigenous Persons Day or Native American Day in South Dakota. Can you talk about the history of Columbus Day and why, why it's now called what it is in North Dakota and South Dakota? Sure, um, well in North Dakota, we still have Columbus Day. Um, there was a bill introduced by Senator Kathy Hogan um, that was wanting to also recognize Indigenous Peoples Day at the statewide level on the first, the, uh, is it the first Monday of each month? Um, so this year it's October 11th. Um, but in years past, I believe the Indian Affairs, former Indian Affairs Commissioner, um, along with others, worked to have uh, First Nations People's Day, which is the Friday before uh, Columbus Day. And so there was a bill introduced to have Indigenous People's Day simultaneously on what is traditionally known as Columbus Day, but that bill uh, did not pass. Um, and so at the local level, I believe primarily on the eastern side of the state, Fargo has recognized or now does recognize the first Monday as Indigenous Peoples Day as well as Grand Forks, uh, which passed recently. I believe Indigenous Peoples Day passed here in Fargo um, in 2014 and then maybe a few years ago in Grand Forks. Um, so it's a growing movement um, locally here, but th regionally and across the country, um, there have been huge strides in having uh, Columbus Day uh, change to Indigenous Peoples Day. So that's just a little bit background of the logistical piece of it. Um, so it varies in city to city, even state to state. Um, and so the, sorry, were you gonna say something? Yeah, well, I was gonna yeah. say, yeah, you're, you're kind of getting into it. So, so can you talk about you know, uh, why the labeling of uh, the day as Columbus Day is changing and maybe why is it hurtful to Native, Native Americans? Hurt? Sure, um, I definitely cannot speak for every um, Native American person in our country, but I can just share 
a bit of my lived experience and my perspective um, and from what I've studied and researched and witnessed is that as I mentioned earlier, as Native Americans, we are often referred to or kind of have this informal training of being an educator because oftentimes um, we want people to know the richness, the goodness, the good history of of Native Americans. You know, we were the original inhabitants of these these lands. Like, for example, right now, the Red River Valley um, is actually the original homelands of the Dakota people and the Anishinaabe people. And I recently learned that uh, the tribal nation that I come from also spent time at the headwaters of the Red River um, near Breckenridge and Wahpeton area. So there's so much history here. Also that Lakota, um, Hunkpapa Lakota used to come to this area and hunt during the summer. So there's lots of you know history in these, these lands, but um, back to being an educator by default as a Native American, um, a lot of our the true history is not taught in the classroom or in the school books and so we're left to fill in the gaps um, in an effort to bring people together to reach a better understanding of our neighbors um, and so to answer the question why is Columbus Day hurtful or why is there a shift happening I would say a lot of it is from people wanting to share their story. And so when we dig deep into our country's history and the history of the founding of our country, um, we find that there, that the, oftentimes the true history is not being taught. And so having Indigenous Peoples Day on the first Monday is, is a step towards uh, celebrating the original people of these lands and that they are still here. <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, if you will, the the current state of affairs uh, on North Dakota reservations and overall uh, for Native Americans in North Dakota. Sure, um, one thing to keep in mind is that I currently represent an off-reservation district, mm -hmm. um, so I'm here on the western side of the state, um, but I grew up on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, so I'm a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikra Nation, and we know that each just as each community, each county is different within North Dakota, um, the same goes for Indian reservations. Each reservation is different. Um, for example, some are referred to as IRA governments, you know, the Indian Reorganization Act. Um, and so ultimately, I believe that tribal sovereignty needs to be protected um, in anything that we do be it the state level, the federal level, county level, any jurisdiction, tribal sovereignty needs to be protected. Um, and so oftentimes, there again, we're trying to educate our friends and neighbors, colleagues on the importance of tribal sovereignty. Um, but each reservation is different. And uh, lots of, there are, you know, some universal issues if we look at health disparities uh, within the Great Plains region, which includes all of the tribe, five tribes of North Dakota, um, we have off the chart rates in cancer, diabetes, uh, youth suicide is still very high. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of issues in terms of public health and trying to improve the quality of life for our, our within the exterior boundaries of Indian, Indian reservations. So lots of work that needs to be done, but if we can get a baseline understanding um, as community members in North Dakota of tribal sovereignty and, and trying to understand why things are the way they are by looking at policies, decades and decades of policies that were by design meant to harm Indian indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Why are some reservations seemingly more prosperous than others? Um, seemingly, seemingly prosperous, I would, it, I guess it just depends on what our definition of prosperous is. Okay. I see tribe, tribal nations who might not have the highest uh, wealth in terms of economic development or casino revenue because a lot of the mm -hmm. tribal casino um, revenue is what supports or what keeps the tribal government running and so that in term oftentimes is the only economic source of economic development for some tribes. Um, you have to factor in their location, how, how close are they located to a major city. Um, you know, we've seen 
a lot of prosperity in neighboring states such as Mystic Lake. You know, it's located near a metropolis and they're very successful uh, with casino revenue and other endeavors. But when I think of wealth and prosperity, I also think of the richness of um, sustaining our language. Language preservation is really important because we know that if a language is lost, a nation no longer exists. And so it's so important that we preserve our language and keep keep that alive. Um, and so it just depends on the definition. Um, but again, there's different policies and choices that different tribal nations have made. Yeah. What's unemployment like on the reservations in North Dakota? I believe that it's, that it's still a struggle. Um, I was Earlier this past summer, I was invited to participate in a missing and murdered indigenous women walk um, mm -hmm. across Turtle Mountain uh, Indian Reservation. And one of the people I met on the walk shared how the uh, stripping of unemployment benefits affected him and stated, made sure he let me know that even within Indian reservations, it impacted him and his family. Yeah. So, well, uh, yeah. You, you know, one of the big news stories right now is is uh, Gabby Patino murder in Wyoming and, and the search for missing boyfriend. And while this is a tragic story, it, it's created a, a discussion more and more uh, uh, talking about missing missing uh, women and men who are indigenous and other minorities. They sel seldom get the same media coverage. Uh, can you comment on that at all? Sure, um, you know, if we look at what happened locally here in August of 2017, um, in the tragic death and murder of the late Savannah LaFontaine Greywind, mm -hmm. we saw firsthand, again, different gaps within uh, different systems. Um, I think the media did the best they could. In fact, that was one way we were following um, what happened to her. You know, we were surprised to learn that she was still missing um, three days later after it was announced that she was missing. Um, there are so much, um, there's so much work that needs to be done and so that is a huge disparity in media coverage. Media does have a opportunity to share the truth but it also has an opportunity to help families of the grieving, families who have lost loved ones. Um, and so we've had different people across the state share discrepancies in the media that they've witnessed with uh, indigenous women going missing, indigenous men, children going missing, um, but yet the, our, our neighbors are receiving a different level of coverage. Um, and so what can that be attributed to? Whether it's blind spots, implicit bias, uh, we need to address this and, and make sure that the stories are, are getting out there. We know that there's a Standing Rock um, member or relative who has been missing for, since this past summer. Um, and so Spirit Chasing Hawk is still missing. Um, and so that's an, another example mm -hmm. of nobody's heard of it. And why is that, you know, is it stereotypes? You know, I, I remember point mm -hmm. blank, um, the people responsible for killing Savannah even said to the cops, she always goes missing. Her parents were just here last week looking for her which is, was completely false, but it's this implicit bias or continuing to have stereotypes of, of Native Americans. Yeah. Uh, do you know how many uh, missing indigenous women and men uh, currently are unsolved in America and Canada? No, not right. at this moment. There's a few things we need to keep in mind uh, when we think of data. First of all, it is underreported or doesn't get reported. Uh, in North Dakota, we still don't have an active database solely for missing people. Um, it, all it needs, what I'm told, is a $75,000 fiscal note to get a database established within North Dakota to track missing people uh, and then also to give access to different jurisdictions, including tribal. Um, so data collection is a huge, huge issue to this day, but uh, it's across the board in yeah. terms of identifying and properly recording. Yeah. You told a, a little bit about your family history, but uh, can you trace it back uh, and, when you, and when was your family first put on the reservation? Yeah, um, further back than being put on a reservation because as I mentioned earlier, these mm -hmm. are our original homelands. Um, and so we say as 
indigenous people or as citizens of the Manda and Hidatsa and Rikara Nation, we, we tell people that we are 100th generation North Dakotans. Um, so we're very proud to be here, uh, still alive today, um, after surviving detrimental policy after policy. Um, and we're here to celebrate our existence, celebrate our children's existence, you know, the fact that we, all of us are here today, um, not only Native Americans, but, you know, everyone has a story and it needs to be told and it needs to be celebrated. Okay, along with yourself, can you talk about <laughs> some of the success stories uh, of Native Americans uh, in North Dakota? Sure, there's a lot of, so much talent here in North Dakota. Um, you know, as North Dakotans period, you know, throughout the country we're known for having such a hard, good, strong work ethic, um, but also our values. And so being um, a Native American, grew up in a rural area, Mandaree, North Dakota, um, family was always number one and also how we took care of the earth you know how what are we what legacy are we going to leave for our children and future generations so there's so much talent in North Dakota um, from tribal college presidents to fashion designers models singers basketball players uh, rodeo superstars I mean across the board there's there's no limit to the talent that we have throughout Indian country can you talk uh, a little bit about how movies and uh, you know shaped the image? Of course, the the cowboys and Indians motif uh, negatively I, I, uh, towards Native Americans, and I guess there were even white actors playing uh, Native American roles for years. Yeah, it definitely played a role in um, in the general public understanding or even realizing that we still exist today. Uh, and so today I think of the young Native American actors, uh, film directors who are out there uh, really busting through those, those glass ceilings or those stereotypes. Um, for example, Rutherford Falls is a series on Peacock TV. Also, uh, Res Dogs, Reservation Dogs is on Hulu. Um, both um, directed by Native Americans. So I would encourage um, our general public to tap into those. I, those are just a few on this huge list of up and coming uh, rising stars. Mm -hmm. uh, briefly, can you talk about higher education opportunities uh, for Native Americans? Sure, um, you know, higher education, education is so important. Uh, we have such a high number of um, tribal communities that have advanced degrees. Um, also really want to men make mention of our tribal colleges, um, the Nueta Hidadza Sanish College out of Newtown, North Dakota, within the, located within the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, was recently listed as one of the top colleges in North Dakota. Um, and having gone to a tribal college myself and taught, coached, and um, led a wellness program at a tribal college in Bismarck for seven years. Um, they are very good educational institutions that really focus on the entire student while fostering our, our traditional values and thinking of the future. Well, I, I wish we had more time. We're out yes. of time. So if people want more information, where can they go? For any of the topics I mentioned, for any, or any of the topics you mentioned about Native Americans, about Columbus Day, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, there's so many good resources out there, but one that comes to mind is Illuminatives. Um, mm -hmm. They're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I would say follow them. They they work to educate the masses on current issues and and that we are still here. Mm -hmm. Well, so. education is what we're all about here, yes. and that's important. So, but thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you, Madzikadads. Stay tuned for more. Gracing a path to the Red River near Fargo City Hall, Spirit of the Sandbagger honors the tireless efforts of the Fargo community to fight the river's historic floods, especially the devastating years of 1997 and 2009. The monument is the brainchild of Mike Benson and the Fargo Lions Club, and many artistic talents contributed to its design and creation. 
The flood projection has been raised to 41 feet. Guard troops started nonstop levee patrols, preparing for the highest crest in history. Emergency response teams rushed to dike breaks in South Moorhead. Crews tried to fill the gap with sandbags around 2 o'clock this morning, but couldn't stop the water. City officials have issued an emergency evacuation. A slow drop in the south meant a first look at the devastation left behind. This is now the worst flood in the history for Fargo Moorhead. During times of flooding all throughout Fargo's history, people along the river, their homes or their businesses were in peril. And where it was decided that they could sandbag, people heard about that and came to help. The key to this sandbagging and diking effort is the volunteers. In 97, that was our biggest threat and we saw all the camaraderie between all the people and the neighbors, everybody was there. A half million more bags, that's the number that these hundreds of volunteers are targeting tonight here at the Fargo Dome. I was told that there were 5,000 people coming up from Minneapolis to fill sandbags, and there were other situations like that all over the city. We had help everywhere, college kids, the high school kids, all of those people helped out. Well, it was a lot of work, but in the end, we survived. We had talked about having a memorial made to the sandbaggers. The name of the project is Spirit of the Sandbagger. The Fargo Lions had a committee. They issued a request for a proposal for a public art project. I talked to Karen Baki. She thought about it a while and she came back and she said, I'll do that. On the metalworking, I stopped and saw Brock Davis. Mike Benson came to my shop and you know, started the conversation about wanting to build a, a, a memorial sculpture for the sandbaggers. And he had some paintings that he'd done where he actually went down to the site and hand painted and drew what his vision was. And I said, you tell me what you want and I'll build it for you. Brock and I think alike artistically, and Mike was analytical. We needed that balance, and I thought we were the dream team. <laughs> Most of these people had a heart in it, so they were more than willing to do the modeling, and I'd bring them in, and we had sandbags, and I'd have them throwing sandbags back and forth trying to get the right pose and trying to get them to be real natural and forget about what I was doing as far as photographing. After the photos were taken, then I put them in a lineup compositionally for the whole thing as if they're filling the bags, passing them, and then stacking them, and with the firemen supervising to make sure that the wall is gonna be a nice strong wall. I did the sketches and then I worked with the computer gave my thumb drive to Brock, and Brock did his thing. We just started with the bridge structure, the skeleton of it. it had the rolled two by six aluminum or rectangular tubing, and then kind of built what I call a ladder structure with the arch in it, and then wrapped it with quarter inch aluminum. From there we cut out all the silhouettes on the CNC plasma table. And then Karen and Mike came over and we set them where Karen had her vision and Mike's vision all come together. I can't say enough good things about both of those artists because we wouldn't have this piece of art if it wasn't for Brock Davis and Karen Bakke. Installation days, I always call them, it's time to take the test day because that's when you take the test see if you did what you're supposed to. I brought the bridge structure down. Industrial builders used the telehandler to lift it off. I left right away to go pick up the silhouettes and was kind of sweating the whole time because they were going to set it while I was gone. Once I got back, 
I saw the bridge structure up on the pillars in the telehandler with the forks on the ground and that was a good feeling because after that it was smooth sailing. Working with Brock was a joy. There was a lot of footwork and I was a little concerned about that when we started to get more people involved. I always say I'm dreaming with my eyes open. It's, it's fun just building and creating. Never would have guessed that we'd have a structure like that downtown five, six years ago when I started this. If we ever have another big flood, the only people doing sandbagging downtown are those 21 sandbaggers. And you'll be able to see them over the flood wall. Thanks again to the citizens of Fargo and all the people that pitched in. The damage that water can do is something that a lot of people underestimate. But what people can do working together is also something that people underestimate. I hope that the community goes down, sees it, remembers what their role was and how they helped be a part of that. If a disaster like this comes along, it's a reminder we work together for the good of everyone. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.